Hi everyone, my name is Paris. This session is machine learning plus a game engine. Endless possibilities. Really excited to be speaking at GCAP. Just in case you're slightly confused as to who I am, I'm the one on the left of this picture. That's me, not the other one, that's an alien. Don't ask questions, you won't like the answers anyway. I'm speaking to you from Hobart, Tasmania, Australia, which is below Melbourne, not in Melbourne. For those of you that get confused easily, it happens. This is what it looks like. It's a lovely place. You should visit when you can do that. So I hope to see actual game developers coming and visiting us in Tasmania soon. It's a lovely place to visit. I do a lot of things, write a lot of books, mostly on programming and video game development. These are some of the most recent and most popular ones. I'm also the co-founder of a studio called Secret Lab. We're best known for our work on Night in the Woods, as well as the Yarn Spinner narrative video game framework. We recently finished Night in the Woods on iOS. It's great fun and has nothing to do with this talk. Today's talk is about Unity and machine learning. Specifically, we're going to talk about Unity and PyTorch. PyTorch is a framework that was released by Facebook quite a few years ago now and has become one of the de facto standards for doing machine learning uh, using Python, the programming language. The other one you may have heard of is TensorFlow. Everything we're talking about today uses PyTorch under the hood. We're not actually going to talk about PyTorch beyond saying it's what powers some of the things you see though. If you're interested, go check it out, it's really cool. Here's the agenda, specifically. We're gonna talk about a little bit about machine learning, a little bit about a Unity package called ML Agents, and we're gonna talk about making a little bot using ML Agents, and then we're gonna see what you could actually do with this in a video game and what you could do with this for non-video game uses with Unity. It's really cool. Let's start with a quick intro to machine learning for someone who has maybe heard of it but not necessarily done any machine learning. Machine learning at its core is about learning patterns from data. Things like object recognition, image recognition, anomalous behavior detection, fraud protection, anti-cheat in video games, and stuff like that. And there's kind of two large areas of, of uh, machine learning that are used these days. One is classifying things, picking things out of a bucket and saying, you know, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a hot dog, this is not a hot dog, stuff like that. And reinforcement learning, where we teach something to do something based on reward signals. Specifically, we're talking about reinforcement learning today because it most obviously applies to the way a video game engine lets you build things. So today we're talking about AI, reinforcement learning, which is a field of machine learning. The gist of reinforcement learning is that describing the rules for the correct behavior of something, the behavior you want to see is actually quite complicated and fiddly. So instead of describing the rules, because it could be thousands and thousands of rules, it could be thousands and thousands of options, it could be branching, it could be huge and complicated, way too hard. Instead of describing the rules, we instead create a bot or an agent, a thing that does our bidding, and tell it to go nuts with random behaviors. It just does whatever it feels like. Random, totally random, literal random behavior. And when it does something that's kind of what we want it to do, it gets a reward. And when we give it, uh, and when it does something we don't want it to do, we give it a penalty, a negative reward. And over time, with a lot of going nuts and doing random things, it eventually converges on the correct behavior that we actually want it to do to begin with, which is sometimes called a policy. At this point, you might be thinking, isn't that just trial and error? And yes, that is correct. That is actually what's going on here. It is trial and error. It's also kind of how humans learn, which is where some of the neural network based terminology that you might see around machine learning comes in. I'm gonna give you a really quick example. Okay, so it's example time. This is an example of a really advanced artificial intelligence learning to do something based on reward signals. It just so happens that really advanced artificial intelligence is John Manning, who is a programmer at Secret Lab, my co-founder. Might walk forward. Have a minty. Thank you. Oh, brilliant. Oh, I might take a step backwards. Give me that minty back. Guess I'm walking forward. Have a minty. Yay. As you can see with John, he eventually figured out that going forward was the correct response. He stepped forward, he got a reward. He stepped backwards, he got a reward taken off him. He got a penalty. Given John's spectrum of actions was forward or backwards, he would have very quickly figured out that going forward maximized his reward, and thus the thing we wanted him to learn was, please go forward. Machine learning, specifically reinforcement learning, is all about learning an optimal policy. An agent, the bot, whatever you want to call it, takes some inputs, which usually mean observations about the state of the world. Observations could be cameras, like visually looking at the world, or they could just be numbers, measuring things, your distance from things, ray casts, stuff like that. Correct responses mean actions which will garner the highest reward. In case of John, he maximized his reward by going forward. Pretty straightforward. To make machine learning work, you need to train your bot or your agent. Training uh, is basically the agent observes some state or information about the environment it's in. The agent takes some actions in that environment and sees what happens. 
It kind of doesn't really have a policy at this point. It's just taking random actions when you start training. It gets a reward or a penalty. If the action is something that we want it to do, it's probably getting a reward. If it's not, it gets a penalty. And it repeats. It takes random actions repeatedly and repeatedly. It does this over and over again in things called episodes or steps. And eventually, based on repeatedly trial and erroring actions, it eventually learns to associate certain sets of observations about the world with good rewards and the actions that match those. So eventually it learns what it needs to do. This is where we can bring in ML Agents. ML Agents is an open source framework provided by Unity. You can get it in their package manager. It's really easy to install these days. We'll put, put a link at the end with how you can get started. We've written a little tutorial for you. Uh, you can bring it into Unity and it allows you to connect Unity to all sorts of Python powered machine learning things, which lets you train things using Unity as the bot, as the environment for this stuff. It's awesome. In Unity, there is an agent. It's usually just a thing, an NPC, a character, a model of some sort, or even just a cube or a ball. It exists in some sort of environment, right? Probably just an empty plane for testing purposes, as you'll see in a minute, but it could be anything. The agent has certain actions it can do. It might be able to go back and forward, left and right. It might be able to apply impulses to roll itself around if it's a ball. Whatever, it could be literally anything. Anything you can map to something in Unity can be an action. The agent has observations about the environment. Those could be pure numbers you give it in your script. You could say, hey agent, you know that you are this distance from the thing you need to get to. Or it could be you give it ray casts, which bounce off the walls and give it actual precise measurements for where it is in the world. Or it could just be a camera that you've pointed down on the environment and you're expecting the machine to figure it out based on a picture, which you can do, and we'll come to that later. So the agent collects those observations and then takes actions and gets rewarded when it does actions that match the policy. And through training, it eventually figures out what that policy is and then you've trained a, a brain or a neural net model, which you can then use repeatedly. It's already trained, it's done, it just does the, does the thing you wanted it to do. It's actually really useful. So in this, this kind of setup, we can look at John again. This is John, the agent is Dr. John Manning, the environment is a local park. Uh, John can step forward or step backwards. Maybe he can turn, not sure, we didn't see it in the video, but maybe he can turn. His observations are his own position, so he knows where he is on a spectrum of not at Tim to Tim. Uh, and he gets a reward when he moves forward towards Tim, and he gets a piece of candy when he moves, taken away from him when he moves away from Tim. That's maybe how our John agent works. But there's other agents in, in Unity's whole package of stuff. There's this one, this is a, a cute little cube. It exists in a formless void and its actions are, it can rotate itself on the X and Z axis. So it knows the position of the cube and it knows the position and velocity of the ball that sits on its head. And what it's trying to do, what the policy we want it to learn is to rotate itself so that ball does not fall off its head. And it gets a, uh, a small reward for every step of the simulation where the ball is still on its head. And it gets a penalty, a really large penalty if the ball falls off its head. So eventually, if you train a cute little thing like this, you will get to a point where this cube learns to balance the ball on its head. That's what we want. Here's our cute cube in Unity. I'm gonna run this, and you'll see. Look at him go. That's awesome. And we'll be breaking down how to do this sort of thing yourself later on in this talk. But you can see this cube, this cute cube, does an amazing job of keeping that ball on its head. Let's take a look at another one. This is the uh, environment where there's another cute cube in it. Uh, it's in a small arena and there's a randomly placed uh, goal area and there's a randomly placed cube. The agent can turn clockwise or counterclockwise so he can rotate himself around and then can move forward, backwards, left or right depending on its facing. It can also do nothing, that's an action. So it has a whole bunch of very specific discrete actions. Its observations are 14 ray casts which come out from various points on its body and they detect the walls of the arena, they detect the goal area, which is the green strip, and they detect the block, which is the thing that's been randomly positioned in the environment. And the thing we want the agent to learn here is that it should push that block into the goal. So it gets a very small negative reward for every step of the simulation. This is to penalize it for existing. Existence is obviously pain, and the longer it exists, the worse it will do. So we want it to economize its movement and accomplish its goal very quickly. So that's why we give it a very small penalty for existing. And it gets a massive reward for the block being pushed into the goal. Eventually, this agent will learn to push that block into the goal. It's a fantastic way of training simple behaviors like this. Let's take a look at a slightly more complex example. Here's a, another cute cube. There's a lot of cute cubes in the demos. Uh, the environment is a circular arena with some randomly placed blocks around the outside that have sequential numbers on them. 
some numbers will be missing from each step. So every time, uh, each tr scenario. So each time you run this, it'll have a different set of numbers, but they'll always be sequential and there'll be no duplicates. The agent can rotate, move forward and backwards and sideways. Uh, he knows his own position and he has a one hot encoding value of the tile present, uh, of each tile present and the position of the agent and whether the tile has been visited or not. This basically means he knows where each tile is and he knows if he's visited or not. And that's reduced into a number that he can understand and unpack that information from. He gets a negative reward for existing as before. This is very common in machine learning because you want things to happen fast. So you penalize them for just existing at all. Uh, and he gets a very large reward for touching a tile in the correct order. So two, three, four, seven, nine, and so on. Uh, and he gets a very large penalty for touching a tile out of order. Not sure why I'm calling him he, apparently small cubes are men. We'll, we'll deal with that later. Here's our uh, really cute sorting agent in Unity. We're going to run that. And he's going to visit the numbers in sequence the best he can. Look at him go. He's doing a pretty good job. Oh, you already got that one. You fool! So that, that's a little bit more of a complex agent. Here's an even more complex one. This is a four-legged creature with jointed legs. So this thing exists on an infinite plane with a randomly placed cube. Uh, its actions are it can rotate each joint. So it's got lots of joints, it can rotate each one of them. It doesn't have any sort of animation walk cycle, nothing like that. Uh, it also knows its observations that are fed to the machine learning system are the position, rotation, angle of each limb and the acceleration and angular velocity of the body and the position of the cube it wants to get to. And it gets a geometric reward, so it's a product of all the rewards instead of a sum. Uh, when the body velocity matches the goal and head direction is aligned with the cube. So basically, if it's pointed at the cube and is moving towards the cube, it gets rewarded, otherwise it doesn't. And eventually this thing learns to move its limbs and kind of walk towards the cube goal. Here's our little crawler in Unity, and if I run him, you'll see he seeks that cube. Look at him go. Oop. Cube's now over there. Here he comes. Oh, we got it. It's just so cute. We've got this one as well, which is a robot arm. It can pick up the cube. Pretty straightforward. Getting an idea right now. You could break this down for all other things as well. So here's a Terminator, you know, its actions are, it can do all sorts of things. Its observations are cameras, IR measurement things, and it gets a reward when it kills any human and a big reward when it kills John Connor. So hopefully you understand how we break down problems in machine learning for reinforcement learning at this point. And now let's take a look at this in Unity. So in Unity, an agent can be any game object. And using ML agents, you make it descend from agent and give it a component type of agent. It's an agent. An environment is just a Unity scene, wherever your agent lives. Its actions are whatever actions you give the agent to do. It can be discrete actions or continuous actions. So it can be like move forward, move left, move right, move backwards as discrete things. Or it can be a continuous spectrum of numbers that represent its position, pretty much anything. Uh, observations are whatever input you give the agent. So you can give it specific numbers. So you can just say, add observation for this number, which could be like a velocity or an angular velocity or anything you like. Or you can give it like a camera or a ray cast or a specific measurement of something, anything you like. And rewards are just a number. You literally say add reward or set reward and give it a number. Bigger is better, negative is bad. That's it. So now we're gonna to switch to Unity and play with our live demo. This is our Unity scene. So. It's pretty simple. I'm going to take you on a little tour of it and I'm going to tell you how it fits together with ML agents. First, I'm going to show you the package manager. So in the package manager, we've installed the ML agents package, which is right here. You can install this uh, yourself from the Unity package manager. I'm running the 2.10 version, which is the latest version. And this comes in through the Unity package manager. So once you've got that, you'll have a whole bunch of useful ML agent stuff, which comes into Unity here, which you get, and you'll get access to the classes you need. So here's our little scene. In our scene, I've built a directional light, an area to group a floor, a target, and an agent. Now, most of you are probably quite familiar with general game development stuff, and I'm gonna walk you through this slowly just to make sure you understand how it fits together. So our floor is nothing special. It's just a plane with a mesh collider on it. Nothing else going on there at all. And it's got, it's been set to green because I am terribly colorblind and like garish colors. On our floor, we have a target. The target is just a cube. Nothing special there either. It's a cube with a box collider. Literally, that's it. It's been set to red because previously mentioned, I like garish colors. Finally, the agent. This is where everything is actually happening. The agent is a sphere that is just placed on the surface of our plane. 
nothing particularly interesting there. It's just on the surface. It's got a mesh render, of course. It's got a sphere collider, of course, but it also has a rigid body because it's the thing that's actually going to be moving. Nothing interesting there. It has a ball agent script, which we'll go through in a moment. It has a decision requester, which we'll go through in a moment, and has behavior parameters, which we'll go through in a moment. So let's start with the ball agent script. So I'm going to open the ball agent script in my editor. This is our ball agent. So in this, I'm going to make the font a little bit bigger. We import all the stuff we need to get access to ML agents. Now, agents are not based on mono behaviors. They're not game objects in the traditional sense, they're agents. So in this case, our agent descends from agent. So here our ball agent descends from agent. We get a handle on our rigid body and we expose the force multiplier to the editor so we can change how fast and vigorously it moves around. We give it a handle to its target, which is the thing we want it to roll towards. And at start, we get a handle on the rigid body. Nothing particularly magical so far, all standard game dev stuff. This is where the machine learning components come in. First, we need to override a function called on episode begin. This is called every time we want to start the agent doing a new episode of trading. You remember earlier I mentioned that training happens in steps in episodes. An episode is made up of some, however many steps it takes to either accomplish the goal or fail. So when we've failed or accomplished the goal, we start a new episode and begins again so it can learn better. So in our on episode begin, we check if we've fallen off the platform. If we have fallen off the platform, we set its velocity back to zero and reset it back onto the middle of the platform. Nothing magical here. Uh, and on episode begin, we also want to move the target to a new random spot on the platform. So again, nothing magic, but we do it in on episode begin because this is what the ML agent subsystem calls when it needs a fresh environment. In a more complex environment, we do all sorts of fancy randomization of the world in here. Next, we override collect observations. This is where our agent gets all its observations from. So in this case, collect observations gets a vector sensor, which is a special class that comes out of ML agents. And to that sensor, we add our observations. So in this case, we're just saying sensor, add observation, the local position of the target. And you may remember the target is the thing that we want the sphere to seek. We add an observation for the local position of itself and we add its velocity on the two relevant axes. That's it. So it has a bunch of numbers getting fed in. You might notice it has no context to these numbers. We don't actually need to give it context to these numbers. Machine learning works by making sense out of chaos. It's kind of magic, it's kind of art. So we're feeding a whole bunch of numbers in and we're giving it a whole bunch of reward and positive reward signals. And it kind of needs to figure out what we want it to do. Magic. Next, we have on action received. In on action receive, we deal with the actions that the agent needs to take. So I'm gonna really quickly jump back to Unity and just show you where this connects. If we select our agent in Unity, you will see here that we have a space size of eight for our vector observations, which matches the amount of observations we're passing into it, and a continuous action size of two. So going back, I'll explain the behavior of parameters in a second. We'll just go back to VS Code now. So our action size is two, so we set our control signal to zero, and then in that control signal, we grab the contents of those action buffers and then use those as a force. So basically we're saying, this is the thing coming in from the machine learning system. This is where it sends completely random actions to begin with. We're gonna take those completely random actions and apply them to our agent using add force. That's all that's happening here. Then we calculate how far we are away from the target. So calculating the distance between ourself and the position of the target and if we are within a certain threshold of the target, which we've arbitrarily defined as 1.42 here, just because we found that was the closest distance, taking into account the size of the sphere and the cube, we give it a very large reward of one and we start a new episode. And episode ends the training loop and resets, calls, calls on episode begin again, resets everything and it all begins again. Otherwise we probably fell off the platform, we also end episode but without a reward. In this case, we're not penalizing it for falling off the platform. We could be doing that if we wanted to. So we could do a set reward here that gave it a negative reward. So next we have an action, uh, another override called heuristic, which takes the same set of action buffers that we were using earlier and just maps it to Unity's input system. This is so we can drive the sphere around ourselves, and I'll show you that in a second. It's not much use making a machine learning agent that you expect to navigate a complex environment, not that this is a complex environment, but if it was, without testing whether the environment is navigable. So it's good practice to use this heuristic method to provide human-driven input, so you can just control it and move whatever it is you need to move around yourself to make sure it can achieve those actions. And that's literally it. That's everything you have in our agent. So I'm gonna save that and I'm gonna switch back to Unity. Unity will do its thing. I'll explain a couple of things before we jump in. So 
the decision requester is attached to an agent and that is the thing that is responsible for asking the machine learning system for a decision. Basically every five steps it asks for a new decision. It can take actions between, but it will keep taking the same action it previously did. You can set this. The reason you have a decision requester is because you might have an agent that doesn't necessarily need to constantly make decisions. You might want to write an MPC that is largely traditional AI, where you've got some sort of behavior tree going on, and then it occasionally does something a bit wacky by requesting a decision from its machine learning brain. So you can explicitly request a decision however often you want. If something's completely driven by AI, you might want it to request a decision between one and 10 decision periods, so very often. Otherwise, you could request a decision whenever you actually need a decision. It's often used for things like Imagine a tank driving around using some sort of decision tree or otherwise programmed heuristic rule set and occasionally it needs to lob a projectile at the enemy. That projectile lobbing might happen via machine learning and you might say, hi, I would like a decision on where to lob this projectile. Just one, thank you. And it calculates based on machine learning because then it's not going to be a precise thing. It's going to be a nice human looking action. The behavior parameters object names the behavior. So each agent has X behaviors, this one's called roll ball because it only has one behavior. It has a space size of eight, that maps to the, add, the sensors we added observations for earlier and has continuous actions of two. That maps to the actions we were talking about earlier. It has a model, which is where we'd point to the model file if it was already trained. We can say, we would like you to train or infer on the GPU or the CPU. Machine learning typically happens on GPUs. So now if I change the behavior type to heuristic, I can use that heuristic method we coded earlier to drive the ball around the environment and make sure that the environment works with my controls. Because if I can't do it, we can't really expect a machine learning system to do it. So I'm going to go to behavior type, set it to heuristic only, then I'm going to run the game. It's going to run. There's absolutely no machine learning happening here at all right now. Now I'm going to click play. Again, absolutely no machine learning happening here, but the ball can be rolled. I'm pushing the arrow keys on my keyboard right now so I can roll this ball around. This is actually quite hard. If I roll the ball over to the cube, the environment will reset and the cube will move somewhere else. So I'm doing pretty well right now. Oh no, I fell off. Yep, so I fell off and the environment reset. That's exactly what we wanted to happen. So I fall off, it resets me. If I hit it, it moves it to a new location. So everything's working as we'd expect, which means it's time to start doing some machine learning. So I'm gonna stop that from running. I'm gonna select my agent and I'm gonna say default, which means it'll work with heuristics if it's possible, it'll work with a model if one is present, or it'll let me train. So now I'm gonna jump into my terminal and show you how training works. To train, we need to run the command mlagents-learn. You'll see my terminal is auto-completing for me, very helpful. Roll ball.yaml, and I'll show you what this YAML file is in a second. And then we need to give it a run ID. Okay, so now I've said mlagents, dash learn, which is part of the Python installation that I've got set up here. This is very easy to install. I'm not going to show you because it would take half an hour and it's not very interesting, but it is very easy. ML agents dash learn. Here is a YAML file which has some hyper parameters, which is what you call the training parameters of a machine learning environment. And I would like you to use those to learn. I would like you to call this run ID ball live. Now I'm going to quickly show you the hyper parameters file before I run this. The hyper parameters file is a whole bunch of parameters of how we want this trained. And we haven't got time to go through this today. I'm going to describe it in a little blog post, which I'll link to at the end. But basically, we want the trainer type to be PPO. There are other trainer types. You can do things like multi-agent training, where they're cooperative behaviors, which we'll touch on later. But you can also do training where you give it a human-provided demonstration, so it kind of learns from a human before it learns from its reward signals, and then you can start combining those together. You can also do something called generative adversarial imitation learning, where it basically pits multiple versions of the AI against itself to learn. There's all sorts of stuff here. We're using PPO. It stands for Proximal Policy Optimization. It is a generic machine learning algorithm that's kind of good at everything in this space. There's a whole bunch of stuff here which says how long we want it to train, how much we want it to remember, how curious we want it to be, things like that. It doesn't hugely matter. It's all kind of just, you know, made up art versus science numbers. So even people who've been doing machine learning for decades basically say, well, through trial and error, we figured out that these hyperparameters were the good ones for this kind of scenario. You can kind of intuit some of them, you can kind of know some others, but all of them, generally it comes together with this is the kind of settings you want for this kind of environment. It's a bit weird. Anyway, if we let this run full, to its full extent, it would go for uh, 500,000 steps and it would train. So what I'm gonna do is now run that command. This is how you train. So I'm gonna run mlagents-learn rollball.yaml run id ball live. 
and that's going to fire up the Unity ML Agent system, which goes, gives us a nice ASCII logo of Unity. And it says here, please start training by pressing the play button in the editor. So I'm going to go back to the Unity editor and push play. Then I'm going to go quickly back to this. I've pushed play. And you'll see it's connected to Unity environment and it started training. And it dumps those settings we just mentioned from the YAML file. And this will train. We're probably going to speed this up in the video because you don't want to sit here watching this all day. So ideally the, the mean reward will slowly climb because there's a lot of steps involved. It sometimes goes up and down a bit before it steadily starts climbing. Again, if the environment was well designed. This one is very simple, so it will converge on a policy very quickly. Okay, so once our training is complete, it will spit out a .onnx file, which is a neural network file that is generated by PyTorch. PyTorch is, as I mentioned earlier, one of the industry standard machine learning frameworks. And at this point, you could take that ONNX model and write a Python script that passes it out and does whatever you want with it. Controls a real world rolling ball robot or anything, literally anything. But you could also drag it into Unity as an asset. So in the spirit of cooking shows, here is one we prepared earlier. Here are some ONNX files that I've dragged into Unity. You'll see they get this cool little, I don't know, it looks like something from Destiny, but it is in fact meant to represent a neural net, I think. Uh, looks like an engram from Destiny, if you ask me. But uh, it is a neural net file, and you can see here it kind of knows a little bit about what produced it. So it'll say like PyTorch, and it has the following inputs and following outputs. These won't mean much to you as a human, but they map to the inputs and outputs of your agent. So if you went and told your agent, it now should expect like five inputs and 10 observations, and that did not match what you would just train, this model is no longer useful for that agent. So they're very paired to the actions and observations the agent can take. So I'm then gonna click on my agent here, and in this field over here, model, I'm going to drag in my trained model. So now it has a thing in there. And now I'm going to run it without running any sort of Python in the background. And this is not going to be very good because we trained it quickly, but it's going to roll around and seek the ball. It will occasionally fall off still just because it's, uh, it's not trained for very long, but you can see it trained pretty well. And you know, I'm not using my hands, so I'm not driving this around. This is my hands, it's working. Uh, and you know, it's learnt to seek that cube. That's awesome. Now you can make a rolling ball that seeks a cube. But let's keep going and look at how you can actually use this for other things. First, I'm just gonna recap how this works. There's an agent in our scene, it is the ball. It collects observations about the scene. These are vector observations, so it's given numbers coming from that code in Visual Studio Code we showed you earlier. It can see where the cube is, it knows its own rotation and things like that. It gets rewarded when it hits the cube, and it doesn't actually get penalized. And through that, it learned this behavior of seeking the cube. Crazy good. So our live demo, you saw that we made an agent that was a sphere. It existed on a plane with a randomly placed cube. It could roll itself in any direction using forces, which you saw in our code. And uh, it knew where it was, how fast it was moving in whatever direction, and it knew where the cube was. It specifically knew where the cube was. And its only reward was it got a big plus one when it touched the cube. That was it. And sure that worked, that was awesome. So let's take a quick look at some video game uses of this now. Here is a really cool example that I like because Unity has gone to the lengths of creating a specific set of their framework for this. So you can tell how popular this is. Really popular genre of video games, specifically on mobile right now, match three games. So Unity has made a specific match three class that you can use to make match three AIs using this system. And it's awesome. It's actually awesome. It lets you create a board and declare how your board works and kind of give it the parameters of your game. And you can attach different kinds of sensors. So it can have a visual match three sensor where it takes a photo of the board and learns how to do it from that. Or it can just have like vector observations where you give it numbers that represent what's in each space on your board. So here we have a Unity scene that's a match three board. This match three board is pretty conventional looking game. And we're gonna step through it and explain what's going on. So we have a little match three game. Uh, we have a bunch of environments set up here that just replicate match three games. Some of them are visual observations, some of them are vector observations. I'll explain that in a second. You'll see it's set up as a match three board, which Unity provides the, uh, the object for, as I mentioned earlier. And it has a match three sensor set to vector observations inside it, which means it basically reports what's on the board using numbers instead of any sort of picture. We're gonna run Unity now, and you'll see that our agent plays the game very efficiently. Okay, this agent has learned to play, learned in about two hours of training, and it can now flawlessly play this match three game, targeting the best moves possible. If we switch to the scene view, we'll have a look at a different board. This board is using the visual observation sensor. So you can see all the elements of the board there. I'll just go back up. 
and we'll have a look at the agent and you'll see on the agent we have a match three sensor set to visual which basically means it's getting pictures of the board and is making its decision based on what it can see so the color information the position information rather than any sort of vector information so that's match three agents in unity unity provides all the things you need to do this yourself it's very simple to get started okay next we're going to have a look at cooperative agents in unity so this is a cooperative environment there are a bunch of agents in this scene that need to escape from this dungeon and to escape from this dungeon here's our little agents to escape from this dungeon they need to collect a key from the the fearsome dragon which is on the other side the agents have a bunch of raycasts which you can see there the the balls at the end they show what they touch in the scene so you know they know exactly where they are and what's near them and what's around them so if we move one of them around you can see those balls will change position this is just standard raycasts all that information is used as an observation that's fed back into the machine learning system so the agents understand their position relative to everything else the dragon over here has a little key it's holding it they need to defeat the dragon to get out and the way the dragon is defeated is they have to sacrifice one of the agents to get that to get that key off the dragon and if we were just using conventional machine learning and each agent was rewarded individually, it would be actually quite hard to arrive on the outcome, which is they need to kill the, the dragon by sacrificing one of them, then another one needs to pick up the key and then they leave. But we're using something called multi-agent posthumous credit assignment, which basically means that they're rewarded as a group. And then the Unity subsystem takes care of using multi-agent posthumous credit assignment, M-A-P-O-C-A, to allocate rewards appropriately based on who did what, even if that agent is now dead. Which means we can end up with a scenario like this where we have these three agents and through trial and error they eventually learn that if they defeat the dragon they get a key and then they get the key and they can leave they will still get rewarded even though they no longer exist in the scene and that basically means the behavior can be learned appropriately to work in a group it's really cool so that's cooperative learning in unity finally and i've mentioned this a few times already we can do visual observations instead of just numbers so this is a very simple grid based game where the agent is the stack of things and it needs to hit the green cross. There's no vector observations in this scene. Instead it uses an agent camera, which you can see on the corner there. That camera is the only observation that's fed into these agents. They are learning what they need to do based on visual observations alone. They receive a large reward when they touch the green cross and a penalty when they touch the red X. That's it. And from this, they receive visual data and they learn which bit of the visual data is good, which bit of the visual data is bad and they learn this fairly sophisticated behavior solely from images. That's a visual thing. So you can hook as many cameras as you like in. Training with cameras takes a lot longer than training with vector observations. So it's just pointing to the camera, you can see it there. That's just a camera pointed down, that's it. But cameras do take a lot longer to train just because there's more data coming in. It's a picture coming in and it shrinks it down to a very small picture but it's still a picture for every frame. So that's a lot of data compared to just numbers. Let's take a look at some extensions and real world uses instead of just using them for video games because it turns out game engines can be used for things that are not games who knew that's amazing so this is a real world robot arm it's called the universal robots ur3e you can buy these for the apparently bargain price of 35,000 us dollars per unit that is legitimately apparently cheap i mean i'm not going to buy one but if you needed to fill a factory with these things this is one of the cheapest good robot arms around as far as i can tell uh, these things are used for all sorts of industrial applications in warehouses and factories around the world. It's great for replacing humans, yay capitalism, apparently. Uh, it's incredibly popular off-the-shelf arm robot. And here's a simulation of it. In this simulation, the agent controls the robot. Uh, six joints, freedom. It uses a joint index to select the joint and then an action index to move the joint clockwise or counterclockwise or whatever, or not at all. For observations, the agent is given the current rotation of all six of its joints and the position of the cube and it can just pick it up. The reward at each step is the negative difference between the end of the arm and the cube. Uh, this is awesome. This is a simulation of the robot arm that you can actually buy. And because of this, it actually means you can bring the brain that you've trained in Unity, the neural net, the model, out of Unity and put it in a real robot after you've built a prototype or a test environment in Unity. And that's just transformative for stuff you can do with machine learning. So it means your, your video game skills are kind of transferable to something else if, if you wanted them to be. The reason we can bring a specific real world robot into Unity is this thing called URDF, which is the Unified Robot Description Format, which defines a robot based on its actuators and its limbs. Unity has an importer for this thing. That's nuts. Totally nuts. Turns out most of these industrial robots run on something called Robot Operating System, and it's all kind of the same protocol. So you can train a real world robot in Unity reliably and accurately and precisely, and then bring it into your real world robot. 
Here's another great example. This is a simulator built by LG to train self-driving cars. Basically, you're making a photorealistic digital twin of a real-world environment with accurate vehicles and sensors, and you're training it using Unity. You get the idea. You can replicate all the necessary sensors with Unity and just train that thing, and then you can move the brain into a real-world car, and it kind of knows what to do. Don't hit trees, don't hit people, drive along the road. This is actually a really cool example. This is a, uh, an example of exploring coronavirus problems with Unity. This is a simulation of a shopping store based on how infectious people are and how many people come in, how many wearing masks and stuff like that to see how much coronavirus could spread around the store potentially. And this is just all done with agents that are trained to avoid each other or not avoid each other depending on the parameters you set up. So ML agents is actually a pretty powerful way of exploring a bunch of real world problems if you wanted it to be. You can connect it to all sorts of Python-y machine learning things. So if you exist in that space, it's a really powerful way of taking advantage of all the knowledge that exists in the Python world about machine learning. You can train it in the cloud, all that stuff. Totally extensible, totally accessible, totally extensible. Really cool. You can also create labeled training data for machine learning applications outside of Unity. So this is a bunch of pictures of stuff you might find in a shopping trolley. This is time consuming and expensive to make. You have to photograph it from different angles and put it against different backgrounds and then train your machine learning model using all this perturbed, complex, messy looking data. You can use Unity to generate thousands of randomly positioned, rotated, occluded images of products, spit them all out after you've measured them to make sure they're roughly real world size, and then generate a scene just randomly and spit out thousands and thousands of images that are labeled so you know it knows which one is the, the raisin brand, which one is not the raisin brand. And you can feed these tens of thousands of images into a machine learning system that's totally separate to Unity. So you might be using something like PyTorch or TensorFlow outside in the real world uh, and you know, massively accelerate what you're doing. This is obviously not game development, but this just shows you how far these skills can go. This is also some stuff Unity can do. It can do image segmentation with your machine learning. So because it knows the depth of things in the scene, you can spit out depth maps and stuff which are used for training real world machine learning models. So that's the end of our talk. In summary, Unity ML Agents is a bridge between the Unity engine and Python. It's really easy to get started with, and I'll give you a link in a minute. It's good for both data analysis and synthesis tasks, so you can create simulations in Unity and see how they behave. You can create synthesized fake data, and you can also create intelligent behaviors about coding if you want to make an NPC for your game, or train a bot that can play a match three game, or pretty much anything in between. It's pretty modular, which means you can hook it up to other existing Python frameworks or Unity things that you need. And uh, really is kind of limited only by your imagination. It's really cool. Really, really cool. Thank you for watching my talk. If you check out secretlab.institute, we will have a blog post up on how to get started with Unity ML agents. And if you're interested, we're also writing a book on it that will come out sometime in the next six months. Thank you very much.